Y'all's doing good, all right? Uh, if you got a Bible, why don't you grab it and let's go to Genesis. We'll first be in Genesis chapter 2. I want to just continue talking about uh, a series on relationships. And today I want to talk about women and wives. So a dude talking about that is going to be good. I mean, what could go wrong, right? Y'all pray, saints, all right? <laughs> so what we've been doing, though, is uh, honestly, I think the theme of this, uh, if I've been able to put a theme around it, uh, has been really centered around the Imago Day. The Imago Day is that uh, you as a guy, you as a female, uh, you are created and you've been created in the image of God. Listen, there, nobody else, all right, nothing else, I should say has that value or worth other than humanity. So here's what that means. That means that you as a created human, you have value over anything on this earth. You have value over a uh, little foo-foo, what we said last week, your dog. You got more value than anybody, anything, any created thing uh, on this earth. So that doesn't mean that we lord uh, our uh, Imago Danis, if that's a word, I just made it up, uh, with, with tyranny, uh, but we use our authority uh, to steward the things that uh, we are over. Uh, this is seen first in the Garden of Eden, where, where God gives the charge to man to be the headship uh, over things, and he says to them to lord over them. So they're in Adam's authority, he's using this authority to cultivate, um, to, to steward the things that God has given him. So it doesn't mean that we use the things that God has given us uh, as some kind of tyrannical leader or something like that, but we use that uh, with uh, the governance that God would want us to do, which is um, to, uh, to do these things right. So it, uh, what we talked about last week, because we, we hounded on um, the guys a lot, I say we, I hounded on the guys a lot last week, mainly because that's what I am, okay? I'm, I'm a male dude, and so I know my tendencies, and I know the male tendency, and, and honestly, we looked at our role, our responsibility as a male, and, and we kind of went on down to uh, what our responsibility is as a husband, right? And so here's what God has given you as a man. Now, listen to me very carefully, because biologically, um, I'm a male, but that does not make me a man, uh, a man according to the Bible, okay? Because my son is, I got two sons, and they're, they are boys. What will make them a man is not growing up, okay? What will make them a man, not the ability to uh, shave their face what makes them a man is not be able to bench more uh, than the, the dude beside them. What makes them a man is not to be able to bench more than their pops because they'll never be able to do that. What makes them a man what makes them a man is not having the dad bod or the non-dad bod. All right? That ain't what makes you a man, whether you go hunting or not. Or how much money you, you obtain in your life, that's not what makes you a man. What makes you a man, according to the scripture, is that you have a biblical view on menhood, manhood, which is having that headship. Yeah. Now, here's what the headship is. That means that we are leading, that you as a guy, you as a male, you are a man by how you lead. Yeah. And so the biblical view of leadership is this headship, which we get from Ephesians chapter 5 that we talked about, is that men, you are leading sacrificially. That you are leading uh, with gentleness, with care. You're leading uh, in provision. Now, that doesn't mean that the women shouldn't work, right? That just means that you better be working. You're not just providing, uh, but you're also providing with care, right? It also means that a point that I didn't make last week that my wife was thankful that I didn't make last week, but I'm going to make it right now, uh, is that we're leading the charge romantically. And I don't know why I forgot to give you that, that charge last week because this week was Valentine's Day. But, man, you are the guys who are supposed to be leading that charge romantically. I sat down last week after the sermon and said, oh, hon, I forgot to talk about leading romantically. She said, good. <laughs> didn't know me, but I didn't need to hear nothing about that. But some of you men need to hear about it, all right, because you don't lead romantically in your home, all right? 
So that is how you are. I wasn't supposed to be hounding on men, but it looks like I've already failed. Um, but let's talk about let's talk about some women, and let's talk about. Uh, that sounds so derogatory, right? Let's talk about let's talk about you women folk, okay? All right, let me get to the Bible because that's a lot better, and I better stick with my notes too because. <laughs> I got some of you already looking at me funny. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And this is some good stuff now. This is really good stuff. I promise, Miranda, it's not going to be anything. You ain't got to gotta worry about it today, okay? So here's what the Lord, Lord does for Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord, God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. So I'll make a helper corresponding to him, or your translation may say suitable for him, or a good fit for him. The Lord God then formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought every, each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that's what its name was. And the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to the, every wild animals. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept God took one of his ribs closed the flesh at that place then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man and the man said and re- shortly he was rejoicing this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh this one will be called woman for she was taken from man and this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bounds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. Now let me make just a few obvious points here. Uh, it, what you'll read um, in the next chapter is, is an attack, a fierce attack, on this idea of marriage. Because what you need to know, married folk, and those of you who are wanting to get married, is that Satan hates marriage. And the reason why he hates marriage is because it is a reflection of the gospel. This right here in Genesis chapter 2 was not just so much about Adam and Eve, uh, but it was more about this coming husband that would take his bride, the church, and they would be one. So, So this is an image and a reflection. Your marriage is an image and a reflection of the gospel. And so Satan realizes that. And so here's how Satan knew how he could get to the man without going to the man was getting to what the man really loved and valued most his woman and that's powerful that God wouldn't go to or, or Satan wouldn't go directly to the man to attack him and to get him to fall into sin but he would go to what the man valued the most women this is what you need to understand that you have a power over your man that you may not realize. And this power can be for the good, or in this case, it could be for devastation. All right, so, so there's just a few obvious things before I get to my, my main point about you, uh, ladies. That, okay. Uh, and, and now, <laughs> there's a problem that's being presented here. And the problem is that the dude is alone. And what was to resolve this issue was not an animal. Women, you better be rejoicing when I say this. You were the first solution to the first problem. I mean, I thought I'd have a few more amens than that because that that was... (laughs) That was good. Listen, the first problem, he's alone. First solution, here comes a woman. I mean, that's, that's, that's good preaching, I thought. And then and just, enough, just two more things before I get to the main point here. Um, how, many, how many Eves were there? Thank you. I was about to say, are you reading the Bible at all, people? It ain't hard. God created out of Adam's side one. This is not polygamy, whereas God was like, all right, Adam, got your choice here, bro. Pick whichever one you like. All right, so men, listen to me. 
When there is a one, when you're married to a one, you're married to a one. That's it. That was God's design for you. This is God's design that you have one woman, and that's it. All right? And then uh, this, this other point here is that the man should leave his father and mother. Now, listen to me, mama boys. Now, you wives, praise God. Now, this is your opportunity to also amen. Not so much that you don't respect your parents anymore, but that's not who you're caring for anymore. Now, maybe when they get older, you're going to have to be caring for them, right? I, I'm talking about now you have joined as one with this woman, not so much more with your mom and dad. You got to tell mama bye eventually. I mean, mamas and, and, and dads, they, they can't be lording over you anymore like they used to. Yeah, that, amen. I mean, when I was going through this, I was like, whoo, these are some good points. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's good stuff. But listen to this thing. Listen to how, I, how he identifies the woman, because this is really good now. He says, I'll make him a helper. I like that. That's a good word right there now. Now, this isn't used in some kind of subordinate way, like, like oh, she's just some weak person who'll help me every now and then. That's not how the word is used here. The, the Hebrew word helper here is Eitzar here, which means strength, which has a connotation is that she's a strong helper. This is how God would identify himself throughout the Psalms in Deuteronomy. God would identify himself as the Eitzar, the strong and mighty helper. So God is saying, and he's identifying himself, how he identified Eve, that she is a strong and mighty helper. She's not some woman who's weaker or who is less than or is someone who is to be trampled on. She's coming in to save the day and to help this brother man out. And so when Adam looks over there and he sees that woman, he's like, finally, I've got a strong and I've got a mighty woman to help me. Because you got to understand, these animals weren't doing much of a help for him. The birds of the air weren't doing much for him. He's got all of this responsibility to cultivate and to steward all that God has placed him over with the authority. And now Adam is rejoicing because he's got this fine-looking woman coming over here to give him a strong help. Amen. Women, listen to how God identifies you. That you are not worth less, but you have worth and you are a strong and you are a mighty woman who is a helper. Amen. That's a powerful, that's a powerful title that God gives you. That he shares one of his attributes, that he shares one of his characteristics with you. And that's good. I mean, some of you women should have did a praise break right there, man. That's some good preaching. That God has given you, not just so your man can lord over you, but now you are side by side with him, and you are his mighty and strong helper. The goal, the role of the women and of wives is that you are strong, and you are mighty, and you are a helper. You are not weak, but you have value, and you have strength. Because I know my weaknesses. And so here comes Miranda to, to, to lead beside me, lead with me. Not that as if I'm, I'm leading over her with an iron fist, but she is leading with me. To where all of my weaknesses, which I got a lot, she's there with her strengths. Because we make a team. That's how it works with marriage. Now, here again in Ephesians, we find ourselves yet again in Ephesians chapter 5. So flip over to Ephesians chapter 5, where, again, I want to just make mention of this because I cannot say this enough, where there was an attack on relationships, and Paul wants to address this in the church of Ephesus. They wanted to do things their way. They wanted to have, they wanted marriage to work like they thought it should work. They were in this uh, Roman Greco 
uh, empire here where women were viewed as less thans. And so the gospel gives women a glimpse of a bright and glorious future, none to which anyone else was offering. And so Paul here is bringing this address to the church of Ephesus. And he gives this woman, these women, and these men, and these husbands, and these wives a charge. Look at verse verse 22. He starts with the woman, and he charges her with this, and he says, women, or, or wives rather, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands and everything. Now, let me give you just a few things real quick because I understand that when you hear that word submit, it often holds like this negative uh, kind of weight to it, but I want you to understand what submitting to your husband is not. All right, so before we talk about what submission to your husband is, let's, let's kind of deflate a few things about what you think it is. Um, again, this does not mean that uh, women are less than or inferior uh, to men. You're not worth less than a man. And so the church is offering this radical new view of women, where women were viewed as slaves, where women were viewed as less thans where women uh, where there was infanticide that was going infanticide that's a very hard word to say especially when you're preaching really fast uh, where they were killing off these women as babies because they didn't view them as the same worth as men and so here comes the gospel of Christ. Here comes, here comes the message of Jesus. And he tells them in the New Testament that they are sons of Christ, not as a gender, but as you have daughters, an inheritance, just like the sons have. That you, women, that you also, you are co-heirs of Christ. That you are a citizen just like a man is in the kingdom of God. And so you have this same idea, you have the same worth, you have the same value as a man does. And so here you are, you, you are, this doesn't mean that your submission means that you are uh, submitting to someone who is viewing you as less. It doesn't also mean that, that you are to submit to some abusive jerk, all right? I know there's kids in here, if you don't. Stop making excuses for his pathetic behavior because he doesn't need an excuse. He needs prison time. If, if, are you okay? If, if he's abusing you, he needs jail. That's what he needs. He doesn't deserve you. He doesn't deserve you. You're far greater than that. You're, you have far more worth than the abuse that this man is giving you. And listen, if you're dating this guy, leave now, all right? Marina and I, we know too many people who have married into that, and they won't leave that situation. Yes, I'm advocating for you to leave that. You don't deserve for a man to constantly physically abuse you all the time. That's not what God has for you. So here's, here's so, so that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you're submitting to uh, some, some dude. You're also not, uh, it, doesn't, it also means that you're not blindly following a man into sin. All right, so a man's trying to get you or your husband's trying to, to get you to do something that's blatant sin. Like, no, you don't submit to that. So here's what it means to submit. Just three things. They're going to be quick. That's a lie. It's actually five things. Maybe. Like maybe 3.4, something like that. All right, here's the here's, here's first thing real quick. Wives, submitting to your husband, it means that you affirm his headship. All right, men, now you can breathe a little bit. All right, because I've been, I've been punching on your heart. You affirm his headship. A woman who affirms his headship, not is always not not one who is always speaking ill of him, especially in the form of a prayer request. 
That's annoying. Y'all pray for my husband because he just don't know what he's doing. Y'all know what I'm saying? Y'all ever heard those type of prayer requests? Y'all better stop in the name of Jesus. You are affirming his headship. Listen to a couple of Proverbs. I think I've given you these before in the past, but I just like these Proverbs because they're kind of funny. It's kind of weird when you read the Bible. There's actually funny scriptures in there. Listen to Proverbs 27, verse 15. An endless dripping on a rainy day and a nagging wife are the same. <laughs> Write it down. Proverbs 27, 15. God compared you nagging women to a form of torture that they call waterboarding. All right, women, I feel the heat coming from you, but you can't argue with me. I'm quoting scripture, baby. Your man does not need your constant nagging, your constant bickering. Your man needs you to affirm him. If as if that wasn't enough, I got one more for you. Again, Proverbs 21, 9. I better stop, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, listen to this one, because this one's just as equally as crazy. It's better to live in the desert <laughs> than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. Here's what God just said to you, men. He just said, bro, I ain't got nothing for you. I mean, dude, you might as well move out to Death Valley and just die. I, I ain't got nothing for that one. <laughs> That's what Proverbs 21, 19, you can look it up. I like, just move out to the desert and die, man. Go have a heat stroke and just... Like you wounding your husband constantly does more damage than you think. Like here, here's what I know. I, 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 I could take criticism from anyone, all right? I mean, it's just what you do. And, and when you're in a leadership role, you just got to roll with it. And I'll just be honest with you, and this may offend you. I really don't care. Um, but if you come to me and you have something critical to say to me, I'll probably smile. And like, I appreciate it. And you know what I'll probably not do? Sometimes it'll bother me, but sometimes I'll just be like, God, you know that person that's just so critical. Just save them. And I'll just move on. You know what I mean? Because your words really don't have, have that kind of power over me. But you know what? If my wife, rather, if she says something critical to me, I'm going to be up all night like, What? Was that sermon really that bad? <laughs> you know, I'm going to be like, I'll probably be reevaluating my entire life <laughs> because she has power over me. Now, that's not saying, now, I don't think that's negative that she has that power over me. I've, I've allowed myself this vulnerability with her to give her this authority over me, right, with her words because I know she's not going to use them in a bad way. Because I know she's not that nagging woman, and I know she's not that quarrelsome woman, and I know she's going to affirm my headship. Listen, I know my wife, she's an incredible leader. She has a dozen or two people that work for her. She's a powerful and mighty helper and a good leader. In fact, she could probably school me in my leadership abilities. But here's what I know. In our home, she affirms me as the headship of our house. Women, one of the most powerful thing you can do, and I'm talking to you married women, is to affirm your husband's headship. Here's the other thing. Wives, you also, and this is this touches right right with that one, is that you're to compliment 
uh, your, your husbands. So uh, you are a helper that you're suitable for him. So not just with your words, but it's almost as if that you are uh, a fit for that person. So what he can't do, you can do. So you're complimenting him. Not just by saying how good looking he is, but by the roles that you're placing in your home is a compliment to him. So where I'm lacking in my home as a leader, my wife's there to compliment it. My wife's there to use her strengths where I'm weak at. So, so women, you're, you do have a responsibility. Wives, you do have a role in your home, and that's to use your strengths, and that compliments your husband, right? Here's, here's another thing. You give your husband, and this is, this is, again, these all kind of just go right into each other. You give your husband the gift of headship. That again, you allow your husband to lead your home. I cannot drive this enough. That you allow your husband to set the tone and the temperature in your house. That you are allowing your husband to lead. And when he's not leading, you're not there berating him and belittling him and talking about how horrible of a guy he is. No, you're there to compliment him. You're there to affirm him. You're there to be with him and to walk by with him. This is your role in, in the house, and this is a biblical role for you. And, and I want to say this, this one more thing here about, about you women um, that I think is known in our church, uh, but it needs to be heard and it needs to be known because women and, and wives, I, I feel like, I don't know, like this is, this is heavy for some of us. You're needed, not just you're needed, but you're also necessary, all right? I, I don't feel like refuge does a bad job with that. Like, I don't feel like refuge is like, all right, women, you don't have no place in this church. You just sit down and be quiet and listen to all the men. I don't, I don't think at all refuge is like that. We, we have women who are serving in powerful ways in this church, and I want every woman to hear me very carefully that you are not a less than in this church. We need you, and you're necessary to what God is doing here. If God wanted all men to run it, this place would last a good week. I mean, you've seen your husband. I mean, come on. All right, I don't need you being the Holy Spirit and helping me with this sermon, right? So I know some of you are like, yeah, I've seen him. But women, we need you to step up in this church, okay? I just need to say that. We need more of you women to step up in this church because you're needed and you're necessary. You have worth. You have strengths. Where I am weak, where your husband is weak, where there are men in this church who are weak. We need some women to step up in this church and say, I'll stand up and use my strengths for the mission of God. So women, you're needed and you're necessary. I know that's like a known, that's kind of like an uncommunicated known in this church, but I just need to communicate that verbally here. That every one of you women in this church, you're needed and you're necessary. We need some of you women to take some of these young girls under your wings and mentor them. We have some young women in this church right now who are about to get married. And women, some of you have been married for a long time. We need you to come alongside some of these young women. We have some teenage girls who could use some of you young college women. We've got a lot of these young women who will need you. You're needed in this church, not just so that you can help one gender flourish, but listen, guys, they may be smarter than us at times. Huh? Y'all like that? Y'all like that, guys? I was trying to, trying to avoid you saying amen. None of y'all said amen. You did good. Most, all the... Let me rephrase all of this. All the time, the women are going to be better at a lot of things, all right? They're going to be smarter than you in a lot of decisions you make, okay? I'm speaking from experience, and I'm trying to help some of you who aren't married 
okay? So the best thing sometimes to do in your relationship is like, okay, baby, whatever. Not like that, though. You better say it with flowers in your hands or something. <laughs> Guys, do not be threatened when females are smarter, when females are more theologically sound. Don't be threatened by that, but use that. Allow them to pour into you, man. All right? Why? Because women are needed and they're necessary. I love stories of uh, about strong, mighty women and how God uses them and, and how God has used them in our past. In the 1800s, there was a woman, I may have shared this story with you, but you, you, know, you, you probably have forgotten, and that's okay. I'll share it again. There was a, a young woman who was set to be an artist for an Atlanta paper. In modern days, she would have been like a graphic designer, okay? So there you go, Mira. There's, there's a shout-out to you. Like, she was going out. She had this job interview lined up. It was incredible. She was like, I'm going to land the job of my dreams. She gets to the job interview, and the dude had the flu that was going to interview her. All bummed out, this guy. He interviewed her, so she came back a couple weeks later. And he's like, yeah, they gave the job to somebody else. So uh, on a train, uh, she sits down with a lady who also uh, is a mighty strong woman of God who just so happens to run an orphanage. And, and she begins to tell this young girl, she says, you know what, I could use somebody like you to help me run this orphanage. And, and this young girl is like, oh, I don't think so. I've got my own aspirations. I got my dreams. I'm going to be this uh, artist for a paper. But then, like, after this train ride, she gets news that they had already given this job away to someone else. And so, and so the woman tells her carefully on the train ride, she says, listen, the best thing you can do is just to say, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. So with this, this kind of door slamming in her face, she kind of took that as a sign from God, like, you know what, maybe I'll help. Uh, maybe I'll help this lady out. So she goes to work for an orphanage. God begins to do a work in her life. She was out one day taking a walk in a garden, and she sits down on a stump, and she just begins to pray, and she begins to cry out to the Lord. The Lord begins to just really do a work in her life. She really feels like God is calling her into ministry. And she, she whispers these words as it's written. That she says, Lillian Trasher says, God, okay, I am your girl. Do whatever you want to with me. The only problem was with Lillian is that she was about to get married. So the day before her marriage, she calls it off and she says, you know what? I'm going to move to Egypt and be a missionary. She moves to Egypt with a dollar to her name. And 50 years later, some 10,000 boys and girls would go through the orphanage that this young Lillian Trasher, when she pledged to God at that tree stump, she said, God, I'm your girl. You know why? Because women are needed and they're necessary and they have a call on their life. And it may look really ridiculous for what God is calling some of you young women to do, but don't let any man tell you otherwise. Don't let any other one try to crush your dreams that God has given you because, women, you are needed and you're necessary. Now, that story, it holds like a lot of weight for me and Marinda. We, were, we read that story to our kids about a year ago. And, and when we got to that little part where Lillian just begins to break down at that tree stump, and she tells the Lord, she said, God, I'm your girl. Do whatever you want to with me. A couple months ago, Marinda was talking to our little girl about just the, the, the act of salvation that God has done. And Marina just asked Nora, she said, Nora, she said, Nora, let, let me ask you like about salvation. Like, have you surrendered? And, and Nora looked at her mom and she looked at us and she said, you know what? When we were reading that book, I said the same thing to, that Lillian said. She said, God, I'm your girl. Do what you want to with me. And here's what I know about my daughter. 
all right? Here's what I know about your daughters. And here's what I know about you young women. And here's what I know about you ladies. That you are needed and you are necessary. And God has an incredible call on your life. Like, like I, I thought it was perfect. Here's Emily, this young girl this morning that we're baptizing. Here's what I know about her. She is needed and she's necessary. She has value and she has worth to the kingdom of God. And she'll do things for this kingdom of God that some of you boys and men will never do. I know that about my daughter, that God will use her mightily because she's got the strength like her mother because God knows and he's got a call in her life and she's needed and necessary and she's going to shake the gates of hell because God's got a call in her life. And what I know about every single one of you that say, God, I'm yours. Do what you want to with me. That moment of surrender, God steps in. He will do things for you, and he'll give you dreams that you can't even imagine. And he'll use you in even greater ways than Lillian Trasher. Listen, this little girl, this poor girl from the United States who went over to Egypt with one dollar in her name is now known as the mother of the Nile. I mean, I just like to be known as the father of the Chattahoochee. Don't nobody know about nothing about no Chattahoochee, but everybody knows about the Nile. The only thing they know about the Chattahoochee is that it's polluted. Drink that water, you start having toes grow out your stomach. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know why I do that. It's just madness. Y'all pray for this preacher. Women, if there's anything that you need to hear this morning, is that God has identified you as a strong helper. I mean, that's got militant weight to it, that when God was described as the strong helper, it was for a time when men were in need of someone to come in and swoop down and rescue them from the oppression of the enemy. So David would, would lament to God, God, be my shield, be my strong helper, because the enemy was coming against him. He had enemies from his left and his right, so he's crying out to God, be my military leader here. And you share that same title, that you are strong and you are mighty, and you could do a far greater work than you realize. That's how God has identified you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for our women. I thank you, God, for our wives. I thank you for our daughters. God, I pray for our daughters this morning that you would make them women.